Welcome everyone. Welcome to week two of Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. I'm thrilled to be back with you. Once again, I wish we were live and we could interact face to face, but thank you so much for all that you shared this last week. Um, that was very vulnerable and I really appreciate that. I think that was a significant lesson. We talked last week about what it is that stirred up your faith to feel after God. Faith is born when God manifests himself to us individually. But we can facilitate that. We can invite that. And usually what invited it was the testimony of man. I wanted you to see that pattern, that it was something that someone said that stirred up your faith and caused you to reach out for God. And that in that yearning, he, he reached out to you and touched you. And that's where faith is born and reborn and strengthened. It's when someone touches us and stirs up our faith and reaches out and we reach out to God and he touches us. So thank you so much for sharing. I'm grateful to be back with you. Allergies and all, I apologize for my bloodshot eyes and my sneezing, but man, is this allergy season and try as I might, it, it gets me. This week, we're going to focus on lecture three. And now we specifically turn to the character of God. And I'm going to distinguish, I'm going to make sure you understand that we are not going to distinguish between the Father and the Son. There is a time. There is a time to say, now, is that the Father? Is that the Father's responsibility? What does the Father do? And what does the Son do? But not today. When we talk about characteristics, we need to understand one major doctrine. And that is that the characters, character of the Father is the character of the Son. Whatever we call the character of God belongs to both of them. And so if we want to see the character of God, and I'm going to focus on the Father, because we need to have faith in the Father. The character of the Father is revealed by Jesus, his Son. Do you remember in John chapter 14, where Philip says, show us the Father? And Jesus says, Philip, have I not lived with you long enough that you don't know me? And then he says, he that knoweth me knoweth the Father meaning the character of the one is the character of the other. So don't be surprised if in trying to illustrate the character of the Father, we turn to Jesus and the Son, because they are one and the same. But let's focus on that. Let's focus on the character. And let me tell you why. If you'll jump to lecture three, verse two, right there in the second verse, 3.2, Joseph says, let us here observe that three things are necessary in order that any rational and intelligent being may exercise faith in God unto life and salvation. Now, it's one thing to reach for a light switch and have faith that it will turn on. But faith that leads to salvation, saves me, is a different thing. And in order to have that kind of faith, you have to have three, there are three requirements. The first, Joseph says, 3.3, First, the idea that he actually exists. Now, that was the point of the last lecture. The idea that God actually exists comes to us when he manifests himself to us, and we believe that, and we yearn for him and trust that manifestation that it has come from him. And now you have the idea. When he answered my prayer and helped me find that ball, I was seven years old. But that day, I knew he existed. I had the actual idea in my head that God existed. So we're going to just simply say that I believe all of you have done. You wouldn't be in this class if you didn't have in your head the actual idea that God exists. So now let's focus for the next two weeks on this next one. Maybe three. I'm not sure if we're going to do this in two or three weeks. But now verse 3.4. Second, a correct idea of his character, perfections, and attributes. If you misunderstand the character of God, it will affect your faith. If you have false ideas in your head about his character, perfections, and attributes, it will affect your faith. For example, um, when we get to lecture four, I think next week when we get to lecture four, we'll talk about justice and mercy, how God is both just and merciful at the same time. But some people push him 
to an extreme in one or the other. For example, there are those who see God as more justice than mercy. He's mostly just and a little merciful, and they see him as a hard, tough man to please. And most of those people had earthly fathers or earthly people in their life that were very, very hard and tough, and they, they impose that upon God, and they assume that God is all just, and that they're not going to make it because he's so hard to please. Well, do you see how that misunderstanding affects their faith? It affects how they repent. It affects their hope and whether or not they hope for salvation. They have a misunderstanding. They do not have a correct understanding of his character, attributes, and perfections. And the opposite is true. There are those that see him as all mercy. There are those that say, well, why try? Why do we need to worry about the commandments? God is so kind and so loving and so merciful that he's going to grant me all these blessings no matter what I do. That affects their faith. That has a profound effect on how they repent. And again, they do not have a correct understanding of the attribute, character, and perfections of God. And therefore, it affects their ability to have faith that leads to salvation. Do you see what Joseph is saying? In order to have that kind of faith, you must have a correct understanding of his character, attribute, and perfections. And then the third requirement is lecture six. We'll save that for another day. How do you know that your life is in harmony with his will? That will be the third thing. But let's focus on gaining a correct understanding of his attribute, his character, attributes, and perfections. Lecture three will be about his character. Lecture four, his attributes, and lecture five will be a short commentary on his perfections, the perfections of God. So since we're in lecture three, let's start with his character. And so after a little bit of an introduction, Joseph introduces six character, six, I don't know if I should say six characteristics or six aspects of the character. He seems to refer to this as singular the character of God. So let me point out that there are six identified attributes, or six aspects of the character of God that Joseph brings up in Lectures on Faith, Lecture 3. Starting in verse 13, 3.13, down through 3.18. And then the rest of the lecture is commentary on each one of those. So here we go. Let's make sure each one of you has a correct understanding of his character. Who is this man that we worship? Aspect number one of his character, 3.13. First, that he was God before the world was created and the same God that he, he was after it was created. In other words, he is the Lord God omnipotent. He is the greatest being in the universe. No one's going to come around and outsmart him. No one's going to outthink him. No one's going to come around and find some flaw in the, the plan of salvation. No one's going to remove him from his place. He's the greatest being in the universe. Now, where I think that shows itself in the, latter, the, the lives of the Latter-day Saints I want to talk about three aspects, three ways in which we need to remember that this is his characteristic, that God is the greatest being in the universe. So let me just talk about three, because in my experience with Latter-day Saints, here where, here's where our faith is affected and our misunderstandings lead to a lack of faith. Number one, he is greater than our problems. He is greater than all of our challenges, whatever they be. If he is the Lord God omnipotent, then clearly he is greater than our problems. Now, years ago, Jesus was on a boat with his disciples on the Sea of Galilee, and a storm hit. Now, I don't know if you've ever been out on the water when a storm hits, but it is terrifying. I once took my son, who was five years old at the time, out on a canoe a two-man canoe, and I'm in with a five-year-old boy. And all of a sudden, a storm suddenly hit, and the wind whipped up like crazy. And it was absolutely terrifying. 
And I was so worried for that little boy. It is terrifying to be on the water. Now, I want you to just see this as a beautiful symbol. You in a boat surrounded by your problem, whatever it is, whatever challenge you may face. I have a dear friend who is struggling with depression right now. And it's like they are in a boat surrounded by this storm of depression. For some people, it's addiction, um, which seems so unfightable and unconquerable. And they are like a boat in the middle of a storm tossed by this powerful force that they have no control over. That's a beautiful symbol. You in a boat surrounded by the storm of your challenges. And then Jesus stands up and just gently says, peace, be still. And immediately the storm calmed and left the men stunned. See, they had never, it had never entered their mind that someone could be more powerful than that storm. And Jesus is. The Father is. They sat there saying, what manner of man is this that, that even the winds and the waves obey him? They still obey him. Everything obeys him. He is the Lord God Almighty, and he is greater than any challenge you face. He is greater than any addiction. He is greater than depression. He is greater than financial challenges. He is greater than health problems. He is the greatest of them all. And so I think that helps us have hope and faith. Now we're gonna talk later as part of his attributes that sometimes he doesn't take those problems away, that he allows us to struggle with them for reasons we'll talk about. But let's not let this affect our faith that something's greater than he. I wonder if maybe there's another symbol we could look at. Remember when Peter, the storm, they're on the boat. They're in a storm. It's scary. They row for nine hours. They've been rowing for at least nine hours. And Jesus walks on to them above the storm. Notice that he walks above their problems. And Peter cries out, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. This is Matthew chapter 14, as you recall. Lord, if it be thou, let me get out of this boat. Can I just take one moment away from my challenges and my afflictions? Can I just walk with thee on the water? And Jesus says, come, come out of the boat. And Peter knew what he was being invited to do. And so he jumps out of the boat and filled with faith in God, confident in Jesus. When his feet, feet hit the water, there's a solid surface and he stands on it. And then Peter took his eyes off the Savior and looked at the storm. And he feared and he sank. And I just, I wonder if in that moment he forgot that Jesus is greater than the storm. I wonder if maybe he just didn't see and in his experience, storms are the all-powerful. And he just forgot that Jesus is greater than this storm. And just for a brief moment, he took his eyes off the Savior. And he focused on the storm. And that's what we do. We focus on the storm of our challenges. And sometimes we get caught up on how powerful they seem. And we sink. We ought not to sink. That is where our faith comes in. We need to know that God is mightier than the storm. Going back to David and Goliath, if, if David looks at Goliath compared to him, he's massive. Goliath compared to David is massive. And you ought to be afraid of someone that much bigger than you. But if you compare Goliath to God, He's nothing. You compared to the storm, the storm is enormous. But the storm compared to God, the storm is nothing. And that's where we hold on to faith. 
and that's your choice. The next time Jesus says, come, and you jump out of the boat and trust him, trust that he's greater than the storm and that he will allow me to row as long as it's appropriate, as long as he knows it's right, but he is greater than the storm. He will not let the storm consume me. And then we forget and we still focus on the storm. If you compare you to the storm and see how great the storm is, you're gonna be afraid and you're gonna sink. Now, number two, let's do a specific challenge. In 2 Nephi chapter nine, Jacob calls death the awful monster. I don't know how closely death has knocked on your door. I lost my father two months ago. I lost my brother when I was 16. Death has knocked very close to me and it is an awful monster. I pulled into my mom's house just as she was coming home from the hospital after my father passed away. And she got out of the car absolutely devastated. I don't even know what word to use. Empty. And I hugged her and she just said, the lowest I've ever seen my mom. What am I going to do without him? And that was an awful monster. But do you remember in John chapter 11, Lazarus has passed away. His two sisters are struggling with the awful monster and they are weeping. But they hear that Jesus has come and Martha runs out there and says, Lord, if you had just been here before, he would have not died which is great faith that Jesus has power over dying. He can prevent dying. You could have prevented the sickness or you could have healed the sickness that caused the death. But there seems to be a, but now it's too late hint in her words. Jesus says, your brother shall rise again. And Mary, like I think a good Latter-day Saint who knows the doctrine of the resurrection, brushes us off to say, yes, I know that someday, somewhere, whenever the resurrection occurs, thousands of years from now, he will be resurrected and he will live again. And then Jesus says some of my favorite words in the New Testament. He seems to say, no, Mary, the resurrection isn't an event. It's not a day. It's not a thing. The resurrection is a man. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He is greater than death. He speaks and death goes away. God the Father is greater than all of our problems. Every challenge we face. He is greater than mortality. He is greater than death. He is greater than addiction. He is greater than depression. He is greater than the physical ailments that we struggle with. God is the greatest being in the universe. Now let me do one more because I think sometimes we don't think about this one. God is greater than time. Sometimes we assume that God is going through the same time sequence that we are. That affects how we think of our relationship, that God doesn't have time. How could he? How could he have time for me? If God is in time, then how in the world does he possibly have time for little old me? And that affects my hope and my faith. To believe that God does not have time for me affects my hope. But God is greater than time. He doesn't run out of time. If someone dies because and doesn't have a chance to get married, God doesn't run out of time. He doesn't run out of time to hear your prayers. Years ago, I read this quotation from C.S. Lewis, and I've it changed me. 
I know it's not really the question I'm answering, but think about how it applies to what we are talking about, that God is not in time. C.S. Lewis asked the question, how can God attend to several hundred million human beings who are all addressing him at the same moment? Well, in our day, it's several billion human beings. Notice that the whole sting of it comes in the words, at the same moment. Most of us can imagine God attending to any number of applicants if only they came one by one and he had endless time to do it in. So what is really at the back of this difficulty is the idea of God having to fit too many things into one moment of time. Our life comes to us moment by moment. One moment disappears before the next comes along and there is room for very little in each. That is what time is like. You and I tend to take it for granted that this time series is not simply the way life comes to us, but the way all things really exist. We tend to assume that the whole universe and God himself are always moving on from past to future, just as we do. But God is not in time. His life does not consist of moments following one another. If a million people are praying to him at 10.30 tonight, he need not listen to them all in that one little snippet, which we call 10.30. 10.30 and every other moment from the beginning of the world is always present to him. He has all eternity to listen to the prayers, the split second of a prayer put up to him by a pilot as his plane crashes in flames. God is not hurried along in the time stream of the universe. He has infinite attention to spare for each one of us. He does not have to deal with us in the mass. You are as much alone with him as if you were the only being he had ever created. That is a tremendous doctrine to remember that God is greater than time. He is not subject to time. God doesn't have to guess what's best for you. He can already see what's happening to you in the future. He is looking at you right now on your wedding day. He is looking at the children you have. He is watching your family because the future is already present to him. God knows what we need because he's watching us need it. He is past, present, and future. He is the Lord God omnipotent. He is greater than all things. He is greater than time. He is above time. He is greater than death. He is greater than your challenges. Please examine your life and ask if that's an element of your faith that needs to be corrected. Do you find your moments like Peter where your fear of the storm swallows you up and you sink? We must have the correct understanding that God is the greatest being in the universe and that all things are subject to him and that his plan will succeed and that he knows what he's doing and that he has written a plan for each one of us and that he is the Lord God omnipotent. All right, character number one. Back in the lectures on faith, verse 3.14, the second character is one that we really struggle with. So I'm not surprised that Joseph lists it second. I'll read it, but then I want to read Joseph's commentary on what we need to remember about it. Secondly, that he is merciful and gracious slow to anger, abundant in goodness, and that he was so from everlasting and will be so to everlasting. We have to believe that it is the character of God to be merciful and forgiving, to offer second chances, to not hold a grudge. He is merciful and kind. As Joseph goes on to explain these things, you've got to read 3.20. In fact, I would strongly encourage you to cut it out, memorize it, put it on your mirror. 
and remind yourself, let this not affect your faith. Joseph wrote, I don't know who wrote this, maybe Sidney wrote it, but Joseph certainly had his hand in writing it, and it's one of my favorite statements. Lectures on faith, lecture 3.20. Unless he was merciful and gracious, slow to anger, long-suffering, and full of goodness, such is the weakness of human nature, and so great the frailties and imperfections of men, that unless they believed that these excellencies existed in the divine character. The faith necessary to salvation could not exist. For doubt would take the place of faith. And those who know their weakness and liability to sin would be in constant doubt of salvation. Sound familiar? I'm going to read that again. Those who know their liability their weakness and liability to sin would be in constant doubt of salvation. If it were not for the idea which they have of the excellency of the character of God, that he is slow to anger and long-suffering and of a forgiving disposition and does forgive sins, iniquity, transgression and sin. The idea of these facts does away with doubt and makes faith exceedingly strong. Oh, if the Latter-day Saints, if my 27 years teaching youth in the church has taught me some th one thing, it is the constant doubt we have of our own salvation because we just don't see this divine character. We do not have faith in this divine character. We do not believe God is slow to anger and of a forgiving disposition. Now, I know that can be pushed to the other extreme. There are those who think too much of his slow to anger, forgiving disposition. But I know Latter-day Saints and I know we're constantly in doubt of our salvation because we just don't think God wants to save us. I received a beautiful, I don't know if I should say beautiful, but I received a very honest, truthful comment from one of my students once. Um, she said the following, if I am being honest, I have, to, I have always struggled with feeling like I have worth. I devalue my opinion and talents because I have an underlying belief that I don't matter and my thoughts and feelings and actions genuinely don't matter. I struggle to see that it would be worth Heavenly Father's time to help someone like me. I struggle to view myself or my struggles as important enough for his help. Logically, when I sit down and type it out, I know doctrinally that it isn't true and doesn't make sense, but that is how I have always felt. I struggle to see why he would want to help or save someone like me. And I think that's a classic example of someone who is fully aware of their imperfections and doubts that God would even have the characteristic to look past them. And so whatever you need to do, whatever you need to do to believe this divine attribute, that God is of a forgiving disposition, that he is very merciful and quick to forgive, quick to let go. We are not. Human beings are not. And because we're not, we have a tendency to assume God is not. But God is quick to forgive. I remember when my oldest was two years old and one night I, I put her to bed and she came out and said, Dad, you didn't get me a drink of water. So I got her a drink of water and put her to bed and she came out a little bit later. Dad, you didn't read me a story. And she thought of every reason not to go to bed. And when she had run out of reasons to not go to bed, she finally went to bed. And it struck me that night that some people think that of God that he will save them when he runs out of reasons to not forgive them. That it's, his, that it's his nature 
to dwell on their sins. It's his nature to dwell on their imperfections and that it's his nature to not want to save them. And that affects their faith. It is his divine nature to want to save. He is quick to forgive. He does forgive. But if you don't see that in his character, if you don't see that as, I love that Joseph lists this second. If that doesn't seem to be one of his divine characteristics in your mind, then your doubt and your lack or your knowledge of how imperfect you are is going to cause a lack of faith. But we have to see that. We have to see God and his desire to forgive. So memorize that one. All right, let's finish this list. The character of God. Third, verse 15. He changes not. Neither is there variableness with him. But he is the same everlasting, from everlasting to everlasting. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that his course is one eternal round without variation. God doesn't change. In other words, whatever he promised someone else, this is where the scriptures become valuable. Because if he offered that blessing to Adam or to Nephi or to Alma, then he offers that blessing to us. He doesn't change. He does, the rules don't change. The way he interacts with people doesn't change. So the same way he saved Adam, he saves today. Whatever he did in the past, he'll do in the future. In the very title page of the Book of Mormon, notice what it says. The main, one of the main purposes of the Book of Mormon was to show unto the remnants of the house of Israel what great things he's done for his father. And the whole point is, if he did great things for our fathers, he will do great things for us because he doesn't change. He doesn't stop doing good things. His goodness doesn't end. He doesn't change. The same being that blessed their lives will bless our lives. If they're in a circumstance and received this blessing, then you can rest assured that when we're in that same circumstance, we get that same blessing. He doesn't change. Another thing we need to remember is if he says something, it doesn't stop being true. If you're like me, I'm sure you've been praying for something. Let's suppose you're praying for a forgiveness of your sins, as I think we all have. We've prayed for a forgiveness of our sins. And then comes that sweet whispering and reassurance that says that the Lord has forgiven us. He said he forgave us. And if you're like me, I guarantee the next day, what do we do? The, the next day, what do we begin to do? Did he really say that? Did he? Was that just me making it up? Or did he really say that? And we begin to question. But if it was true yesterday, it's true today. If the Lord gave you an impression, if he gave you a prompting and you acted on it, it's still going to be true tomorrow. If he, if you're dating someone and you're thinking of marrying them and you ask the Lord for confirmation, and confirmation came. Don't wake up in the morning and start second guessing. If it was true yesterday, it's true today. He doesn't change. I'm going to give you a wonderful recess in the readings. Um, this is a non-required reading. You'll notice it's down below. Elder Holland gave a great talk called Cast Therefore Not Away Your Confidence. Let me just give you one little snippet from that talk. And you'll see why I include it. This is a wonderful thing to remember. It is critical that we remember that God doesn't change. Elder Holland said, I wish to encourage every one of you today regarding opposition that so often comes after enlightened decisions have been made. After moments of revelation and conviction have given us a peace and an assurance we thought we would never lose. Once there has been genuine illumination, beware of the temptation to retreat from a good thing. If it was right when you prayed about it and trusted it and lived for it, it is right now. Don't give up when the pressure mounts. That's that idea that God doesn't change. And what he said yesterday is still true today. Read that talk if you've had a, a tendency to doubt those types of things. It's in the readings. 
but I bear you my witness, God doesn't change. He doesn't change. The same God he was in the Book of Mormon is the same God he is today. If he preserved the stripling warriors miraculously in, in their day, he will preserve modern day stripling warriors miraculously today. That's why we have the scriptures is because we trust that God does not change. Now that leads us to another character of God, another aspect of the care. I'm gonna skip number four for a second because three and five go so well together. The fifth one is that he is no respecter of persons. Every nation, but in every nation, he that fears God and works righteousness is accepted of him. In other words, not only does he not change, but he doesn't have favorites. He doesn't like certain people more than other people. He doesn't like them more. He doesn't respect, he doesn't have, he's no respecter of per persons. But sometimes we have that. Sometimes we consider ourselves second class saints that he loves my bishop or the goody goody people in my ward that never do anything wrong, but me, and you'll notice that a lot. Notice how Laman and Lemuel asked Nephi some questions about the tree of life. And Nephi said, well, have you inquired of the Lord? And he said, no, we haven't because he maketh no such thing known unto us. Clearly he makes that known unto you, Nephi. That's why they're asking Nephi, but he doesn't answer my prayers. And we have a tendency to doubt that I'm as good as someone else. I'm as loved as someone else. But it is essential that we understand that, Garrett, that God doesn't have favorites. That he loves all people equally and opp gives opportunities to all people. And that's critical. God is not racist. He isn't biased. He doesn't change. What he did to them, he'll do to you. No one receives a blessing that you can't receive if you do the same thing they did to receive the blessing. Number one, he doesn't change. And number two, he doesn't have favorites. Now let's go back to number four. He's a God of truth and cannot lie. He cannot lie. Every promise he's given, he will fulfill. Every one of them. If he gave a promise, he will fulfill it. I don't know how, I don't know where, but if he gave a promise, he will fulfill it. If you received a promise from God, he will fulfill it. He doesn't change. He doesn't lie. He doesn't remove his blessings. And the last one is one that almost goes without saying, God is love. Love and God go hand in hand. And that's one that we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about later. God is love. He is the embodiment of love. He is the essence of love. If you want to learn how to love, we look to God. And that's why charity is the greatest of all. Love. So let me just see if I can summarize the six aspects of the character of God. Number one, he is almighty. He is all powerful. Nothing is more powerful than he is. He is more powerful than your problems, your challenges, your enemies. He's more, he's more powerful than death. He's more powerful than sin. He's more powerful than addiction or habit. He's more powerful than depression. He's more powerful than any chemical. He's more powerful than any emotion or any sickness. He is the Lord God omnipotent. He is merciful and kind and quick to forgive. He doesn't change. He doesn't tell a lie. Whatever he says, he will do. He tells truth. And nothing he says are, are half-truths. And so we must believe him. He doesn't have favorites. He respects all people equally. And he is love. Love and God go hand in hand. Those are the character, those are the aspects of the character of God that Joseph Smith teaches in lecture three. Here's your assignment. I want you to, as you read through lecture three, I want you to focus on those six and think about them. Think about the things that we've talked about. And <clears throat> I know this is going to be a little vulnerable and I um, applaud your vulnerability last week. I'm wondering if maybe we can do it one more time. Which of the six has been your struggle? If faith requires a correct understanding of his character, 
what's the biggest threat to your faith? Which of the six has been the biggest challenge in your life? Um, seeing something else is more powerful than God, like your problems getting, or seeing the storm and sinking, not seeing his mercy and his tendency to forgive, forgetting and being, knowing that I have a propensity for sin, I lose hope. Is it that I don't think that the promises apply to me like they applied in the past? Is it that I don't think I'm as good enough as other people? Is it that I don't trust his promises because I don't think he really keeps them? He lies. Is it that I don't think he loves me? What is the biggest challenge? Which of the six is your weak spot? And what needs to be strengthened? If you don't mind sharing that, I'd love to hear it. Now, if you're uncomfortable with that, and I know that requires some vulnerability, and, and I understand that if you're uncomfortable sharing that, then which do you think is the weakness of most of us? What do you think is the hardest of the six for human beings? Which, in which area do we struggle? That's the question for the discussion this week, is in which area of those aspects of his character do you or we as a human, er, humanity find the biggest struggle? What do you think and why do you think it? Um, I'd love to hear. Make sure you include it in the chat. If you'd like to chat with me privately, just text me. If not, please join our group me class and share your thoughts to that answer. Um, I want to leave you with my testimony. I bear you my witness of the character of God, specifically going back to number two. I bear you my witness that he is quick to forgive. He is of a forgiving disposition and he does in fact forgive. That I know and of him I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.